welcome to the Inqua Podcast, Kevin Bisset. Thank you so much. I feel welcomed. Because it's been seven years at this point? Six years? No, it's got to be seven years. Seven years, yeah. Because we met, it's a little more than seven years, I think. It might be more. We met at the Catholic Mass, or maybe it was a concert. Do we meet at the Catholic Mass, or do we meet at the basketball? Uh, we were watching like the March, not the March Madness. It was LeBron's last game. Not LeBron. No, Kobe's last game. That's where we met. Kobe's last game. Rest in peace. That's right. And then we saw each other again at the Catholic Mass slash concert. It was Kobe's last game, and simultaneously, Steph Curry was breaking the record for most threes. Was it that? Yep, it was happening simultaneously. Or was it the Warriors getting to... Oh, and, and, and it was the Warriors getting to 80 games. It was all of those things that once. That was once. a big night of sports. Yeah, it was a huge night. It's like a very historic night of sports, honestly, as far as basketball goes. And we had two TVs up, and we were watching both of them. And then we went to the Catholic Mass, which was dope. Neither of us are Catholic, but it was a really fun. It was like a choir concert there, and it was so sick. I mean, a Catholic Mass in Provo, Utah, just hits different. And we went with someone who was on my mission, who was the bird watching guy, who really liked bird watching. Alex Beck, yeah, he and I were roommates. Yeah, and he's cool too. We've got nothing but connections. You're you're Mister Connections, though. To be fair, hey, you know, we're we're trying to call on more to get on the podcast. I mean, you're a talented musician, an econ whiz kid, and I know with Cole and I talking about movies, I'm like, I can't, I don't want to leave music out. We did a little more music writing on on the magazine, but this is the first podcast we're talking about music, and I think it's an important aspect of all things. I actually don't know much about how you got into it or anything pre pre-meeting at BYU and up in Provo. Did you grow up in a musical household? When did you start? I did not grow up in a musical household, but I was always really obsessed with music. And it's weird because I think if I had grown up in a musical household, I would have been pushed in that direction a lot more. Like I was writing stupid little songs when I was like three and like performing them in front of groups, but they're not good. You know what I'm saying? But they were accepting. Yeah, there's like little videos, like home videos of like me doing like a song called super Kevin when I was a little kid and at like family reunions and stuff. And then I would like always sing karaoke and stuff. And so my parents were like, Oh yeah, he's like into it. And people would come up to him and be like, Oh my goodness. He has like really good pitch and da da da. And like, be like, wow, this is amazing. And I was just like, I'm not aware of it, but my mom told me about it later type of thing. Like when I was older and, and I always had these like aspirations to be like a Mozart type, person you know where i saw him and i was just like he's so sick he was young and he was doing all this crazy stuff and my mom thought about like you know having me be a little play monkey thing that like went around doing things and then she was like that's not the right thing to do for a kid so it didn't happen i mean did you have lessons growing up at all yeah i had piano lessons growing up i didn't have vocal lessons which is too bad and and we when i started really getting into like writing music, like really into it. We lived in Logandale at the time and there wasn't really anyone out there who taught about composition. And so I had to learn it basically like School of Hard Knocks and then studying just other songwriters and stuff and trying to figure out what they did. And um, then I went to BYU, took songwriting classes and got into that more. And now the stuff sounds sick and it's unrecognizable from my early stuff. I mean, yeah, growing up in, in high school and stuff, did you play at like school concerts? Yeah. Did you? Yeah, I had a band in high school. Mm-hmm. And have you recorded all those songs and put them out anywhere or are they just tucked no. away? No, 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 no. There, there is like a place on YouTube and I don't know, I don't know how to find it. And I need to take some videos down on that YouTube channel. So I'm not going to say the name of it. But there, there are old videos of me singing little songs I made up and we made songs as a band. We wrote like a couple songs, but we never performed those songs. We just did covers. I mean, I got to know you were in a band. Who were you covering? Was it people you liked? Was it old 80s stuff? Was it brand new? My bandmate realized that I had could do a really good impression of Ben Gibbard from death cab. And so we did a death cab cover first. And then we did some red hot chili pepper stuff. It was so funny. It was the, this is the, this is just a funny thing to me. I don't know if it's funny to anyone else, but he asked me when we were going into the, doing the red hot chili peppers, he's like, oh, do you think you can sing this? I was like, yes. Do you, can you play it though? Like, cause they weren't like, the, they're, they're decent guitars and bass players, but they weren't like, I mean, 
you have Flea and John Frusciante who are incredibly talented. I mean, Chad Smith plays pretty simple stuff. He's also very talented. But Kiedis is not a great singer. He's not doing anything really crazy with his voice. He's better now, but we were doing older songs too, and it wasn't hard to sing at all. And so it was just so funny because they couldn't figure out the guitar parts. They couldn't get those down. But my singing was fine. But he was like, are you sure you can do it? And I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I can do this. Like, it's not going to be an issue. Are you sure you can play it? Yeah, that's, that's what <laughs> that's I was thinking. Good. I was like, this seems like kind of hard. And they couldn't. I have a dream of mine. I want musicians to look back 10 years before and re-record or find old recordings and just put together a big anonymous compilation album. I want to see what John Mayer was playing in middle school. You know what I mean? I want to see what these people were playing before they had gotten their chops. You know, I just think it would be a fun thing. And therefore I thought about it with you. I'm like, what were you playing back in high school? Where can we find those? Those are not great. I mean, I, I can, I can dig some stuff out. I actually tried to dig one out recently. That was kind of this, this song. And I have another song from that era too. Like I, I have some songs from back then. They're not good. I mean, if you go back, like my early stuff when I first started college, like my freshman year of college, that stuff is when it starts to get decent. That's when it's like, okay, this is acceptable, you know? And one of them I even occasionally play at shows. Is like, I haven't recorded it because I just haven't bothered to. But it's good enough that I feel okay playing it in front of a group of people, you know? That's a good sign. That's some longevity. Yeah. No, that one's a cool song. But I mean, in general, that's not like going back into like high school and middle school. Like when I hear it's weird because people will sometimes freak out over young artists. And I just it doesn't affect me the same way because I see what they're doing. And I'm like, this isn't that impressive. And they're like, yeah, but they're only 14. I'm like, yeah, it shows like I I don't want to like I'm not putting them against other 14 year olds is my thing. I'm saying. How good are they, you know? And when you compare them to 30-year-olds, the 30-year-olds are better. Like, every single time. I I just went to a show tonight supporting some local Vegas musicians, and there's this guy, Ted Sable, and he's he's a bit older. Might be in, like, his late 30s, 40s. I don't really know. Just phenomenal voice. Phenomenal musician. And he's killing it in the local scene, but it's just, like, like, I love when, like, someone in that like who's starting who's not likely a little kid is killing it that to me is like that's more impressive and then someone who's like 16 sounding like a 16 year old and over singing everything because they i feel like they always over sing things and i'm just like tone it back like you just just sing the song i mean do you feel like some of it is do you feel like some of it is that because they're young everyone's enamored and just like we all love kids in this day and age in society. Do you think that's part of it? Is it just that they're like so poppy and catchy because it sounds like they're 16 that it's easy to sing along with? What do you think the, the X factor and the hype? I think it's the obsession with youth. And here's why. And I, I've heard this story and I can't remember the band that did it, but there was a band and they were, they were getting older and they decided to release music under a new band name and the new band was a bunch of young kids like that was the thing that was the front and so they had these young kids do performances and then in the back there were these old guys playing the music and people didn't know and so this band started blowing up and these guys had been seen as like oh they're past their prime they can't make new music but everyone was like these guys are so good and they were freaking out and then one day they revealed like oh we're just these people and everyone's like oh you lied to us and they're like we were trying to find a way to get music out there because you stopped paying attention to us. There's a bit of ageism like in favor of the young in music, and I think it's, I think it's stupid. How do you feel about artists releasing different types of music and their evolution as they go on? Because I love talking about this, but you know, I John Mayer it. had born and raised, and to your point, I, I think I kind of agree with you. As they get older, they usually get better, but I feel like they leave the fans that love the young poppy stuff behind who just can't grow with it. I think some of the stuff's still poppy, though. For example, I was talking to a friend of mine just yesterday, and we were talking about Paul McCartney and Paul Simon, and he was like, you know, Paul Simon's, he told me Paul Simon's best stuff is when he was with Garfunkel. And I was like, I disagree. 
I mean, he's, he released much better stuff later in his career and he's still releasing dope stuff, you know, like he hasn't stopped and it's great. And he's like, I actually haven't listened to a lot of that stuff. And I'm like, and he's like, I guess it must be a nostalgia factor too. Cause like the stuff I have listened to, I haven't been into as much. I'm like, what about like, you can call me Al, you know, like that song's dope. And that's well after the Simon Garfunkel era. And he's like, I don't know. So it's such a, it's a pop song. And that's the thing. Paul Simon never stopped writing pop songs. He used different instrumentation, but he never stopped writing pop. Paul McCartney, same thing. McCartney three is phenomenal. And Egypt station, even better. Like, and this is like, he's an old man and it's still pop songs. It hasn't changed from being pop songs. He's been poppy the whole time. It's just, people just think it's not going to be good. They think they can't. And like Bruce Springsteen, my favorite Bruce Springsteen album is Letter to You. Letter to You is so, so good. good. It is such a good album. But people don't pay attention to it because he's old, you know? And, and to me, like, I listen to, like, the Born in the USA album, and then I listen to Letter to You, and I'm like, Letter to You is better. It's just better. And it's just as catchy. Just as catchy. It's just as good. So I don't, I don't know if it's a catchy thing. I think it's a... I think it's an ageist thing. And, and I mean, to some extent, there's that like, you know, oh, they're not on top of the trends, but some people are on top of the trends. Some people do get it. When Sting and Shaggy released that album a few years ago, I was like, Sting still gets it. Or like Dead and Company. You know, you listen to Dead, like we, we went to a Dead and Company concert together. And I mean, holy cow, Bob Weir is still Bob Weir. He sounds like an old Bob Weir for sure, but I like the old voice. I think it's cool. I want to be like that. I'm super sad they're ending it or what. I don't know what they're doing. I, I hope they're not done done. I hope it continues in some form, but I think this form is coming to an end, which is super sad because I've loved, I loved that show. That was such a great show. We definitely got secondhand high in something. There was enough floating around. I felt like I was in another universe. Who do you think from like the bands of our youth will carry the torch way into their old age, like Dead and Company, Bruce Springsteen, Sting, I mean, Fleetwood Mac? Who's going to keep playing and being that huge band? I mean, obviously, Death Cab is still playing. Here's the problem with Death Cab is Death Cab was really reliant on two people. It was reliant on Chris Walla and it was reliant on Ben Gibbard. Chris Walla is not part of it anymore. And you can tell. It's not, it's not Death Cab anymore. And like, they haven't, he hasn't found someone that is his Chris Walla, you know? And you can tell. And to me, that's like, okay, you need to like rethink this in a major way. I, th- I, think, I think Ben's been a little bit off the mark, but some people really like the last album. So maybe I'm off the mark, you know? I would say, I would say the Killers have a good chance of keeping that longevity going just because... I mean, you listen to Pressure Machine, right? Pressure Machine was a work of art. And you've, you, did you live in Logandale ever or Mesquite or what? I, I traveled up there. I never lived okay. out there. Have you ever lived in a small town or no? no I think just a short term. Oh, well, no, no. Bakersfield, where I grew up, which Bakersfield, less than 200,000 people, farms, cattle. So you, you listened to Pressure Machine and you probably got it. You got what it was talking about. Plus, spending our time in Utah in college and visiting my uncle down in small towns and driving through Nephi where he's talking about him, like, I know these train tracks. I know what he's talking about. You know about. what he's talking about, and it's, it hits so hard. That album is amazing. It's emotional. That's, that's one of the best Killers albums ever. Which, to your point, lovers of Hot Fuzz and, you know, Sam's Town would not feel the same way unless they had maybe matured with it and liked the music more than the nostalgia. I guess. I think Quiet Town still is a bop no matter like who you are though. I don't know. So and, and the killers still bring like massive crowds to their shows. Yeah, so I could see the killers being that. I could see who the thing is, I don't know. Cause De- Dead and Company, the thing that's different about Dead and Company is they are first and foremost a live band. And there's not a lot of bands right now who are first and foremost a live band, if that makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Like, like who, who's like known for their live sound? I mean, that's not really the thing right now is people super well known for their live sound. I don't think. Who do you, who do you think? 
I can't even, yeah, I mean, unless you're going jam bands and talking fish, I can't think of someone who it's like, you have to see well, him and live. Fish is, fish is like that, for sure. And I, and I would say fish, I was thinking fish, but I'm like, but they're kind of, they're not, they're not young. Well, they're not all, they're, they're, they're not of this time either, really, you know? It's not, like, they're a little older still, right? Or I, yeah, they are. Maybe Dave Matthews Band? Yeah, he puts out a performance. Yeah. I'll say I had a friend go see him at the Hollywood Bowl like we saw Dead & Company, and he paid massively for those tickets. It was expensive. And I didn't know Dave Matthews Van fetched that kind of thing, but you're right. They, they are well known for having a really good live show, Dave Matthews Band. You know who surprised me from our childhood or a little older? Goo Goo Dolls. I saw him a few years ago. Knock my socks really? off. Really? So good live. I would not, I didn't even want to go. <laughs> my mom loves them. They were so good live. I could see, because, and, and see, the thing is, Incubus is probably another one of those bands I could see staying around for a while. Red Hot Chili Peppers, but they're a little, they're older than us too, you know? But they, they are, and they're, I feel like they're, they almost are a little bit better known for their records than their live performances. I'm trying to think. It's it's a tough like thing. Foo Fighters might be up Foo there. Foo Fighters, yeah. They, but now that Taylor's gone, it's like it's a, in a weird place too. I don't know, man. It's that's a really good question. It's a hard thing because there's just, there, there's not a lot of bands who are known for jamming and like playing live in that way. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's I don't think it's a bad thing. It's just that's the nature of it right now. You know? Do you think we've been so conditioned that that just wouldn't fly anymore with most audiences? doing a live thing doing more jamming and just you know long guitar solos things like that i went to a dawes concert last august and they played just a new album which i love dawes but just the new album is long eight to ten minute long songs jamming all kinds of instrumentation the whole audience checked out everybody checked out that's weird and i was just like oh i don't know maybe it's just the venue or it's la no one was down for it. And I was like, this is enjoyable. Like I enjoy the music and I love like listening to the licks and how they've changed it from the album. Nobody cared. Okay. So I have two thoughts in response to that. One is going to a John Mayer. Cause I've gone to a John Mayer concert as well as a dead and company show. And the John Mayer concert, they expect John to start playing the guitar and to start going crazy on the guitar. And that is great. That, that is just like a great moment there. And people like that. And it, it's cool. Oh, I, I just thought of someone. Um, Vampire Weekend. Vampire okay, Weekend. Yeah. He worships Dead and Company, Ezra Kenning. And I could see Vampire Weekend trying to be that thing. I think they want to be that thing. I don't know if they will be, but they want to be. And they put on a great live show, to your point. People want to see them live. Yeah. And then the other thing I was going to say is I feel like what's kind of happening now is we're getting into what's called the silo circle model. So it's a model of preferences and it shows that the ideal thing is to find your point on this circle and to take your audience from that point. And it's less about like, you know, meeting in the middle and it's more about like finding which type of preference people like and playing to that and really like hyper-focusing on it and feeling like each individual part of it. So I feel like the people who like jamming out music are down for like full instrumental stuff, which is why you've seen the rise of these instrumental bands, these math rock type instrumental bands that have just been killing it recently. Because think about Chon, think about Polyphia. Polyphia is huge right now. They've had like songs go number one trending on YouTube, you know, and they're an instrumental rock band, you know, and then you have Snarky Puppy too you know so you have these groups that are doing jam things and that are incredibly popular for doing jam things and they appeal to their audience like the people who know about snarky puppy will sit you down and they will buy their dvds and they will like invest in them and they're like hey you've got to listen to snarky puppy you've got to listen to like family dinner set sessions with snarky puppy and i'm like okay i will sit down with you and i will listen to this and it's it's becoming a community but there's like the there are pop artists who are pop artists and then there are jam artists who are jam artists and it's it's been a thing like that for a little while like billy talent is another great example of a band that was well known to like just mainly be a live band you know their records are still cool but they're well known as like 
that's where you want to see him is live. And to your point, if they're not putting on a show like Taylor Swift or Beyonce or like Billie Eilish, if it's not like a performance performance, at least in my circles, I see people going to concerts less because they're like, well, I can listen to them or I can watch something or whatever. What do you think right now is the draw for people to go see new bands, up and coming bands, people who are not the killers or people who are not Bad Bunny? They're doing dope stuff. I mean, you go to a local scene. And the other cool thing is like, it's, there's less of a barrier of knowing them. You know, I've heard this said in interviews and like in music conferences and stuff. And I've seen it so much too, is that the people who make it in music are the nice ones. Niceness in the music industry is so important. And you see that in the local scene because the people, you you can meet those people, you know, and at that lowest level, you can go up and talk to the band afterwards and get to know them and they will talk to you and they will hang out. And that's so cool. Getting to know someone who just like rocked your socks off. You know, I know some people who don't like going to shows when bands get too big because they like the intimacy. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. A little more authentic, a little more like their mind. Do you think that, you know, like it's like a possessiveness of sorts or like a personal connection? It's not just that. It's like, it's the, the ability to like dance around with it, you know, and to pay a lot less money and to still get like really great performances too. You know, I don't know that it's like the mind thing. I think it's more of just like the intimacy that, Ability to so connect. Less like a fangirl or a. Well, I'll still fanboy. The, the solo fan who goes to every single show. Yeah, okay. Like, for example, seeing Ted Sabley tonight, great musician. I fanboy over Ted. And he knows I fanboy over him and he's okay with it. But I'm just like, dude, you're the best. Like, I freaking love your, like, going to your shows. And I like screaming out and saying things because I'm just like, he's great. I mean, while we're on the call, let's just do some shout outs. Who else are you listening to that you're like, I just can't get enough? I listen to a lot of pop music and a lot of like K-pop and stuff and Japanese and all sorts of stuff. So it's, it's, it's going to be all over the place that I've listened to recently and been into. So Skrillex's two new albums were sick. I don't know if you've checked them out, but they are I phenomenal. Like front to back, both of them just great, great albums. And those just came out. Carol G just put her album out and that was cool too. So I've been getting into Zutomayo recently and they are sick. They are Japanese band who is just killer. Me, Miyazaki Suzuku is this, he's called like the Japanese, like love song man or something like, and he is just phenomenal. He's like a crooner type. And so his music, it sounds like this Frank Sinatra stuff, but he's singing Japanese. And it's really like big band type stuff, but it's kind of that city pop big band vibe. He's really cool. Then you've also got, you know, your EXO, who's just, I love EXO and Tae Young, Big Bang, Blackpink, of course. I mean, that's like an obvious one because their album last year was phenomenal. Spoon's Lucifer on the Sofa from last year was a ridiculously good album. Un Verano Sin Ti was also a great album, that Bad Bunny album. Local bands that I'm liking a lot. I like Jack Jack, obviously. It's my band, so I like him. John Foley is another artist who moved to Vegas recently. I really like his stuff. I'm working with Cody now, so Dak. We're releasing a song pretty soon. His out series was great. Shikati is another artist who's going to be on that as well. Kook and I are doing a song together, and Kook's really great. Another person I just saw tonight, Hunter's Briefcase. They're really cool. They've got some really interesting ideas. The forums take turns that I'm not always like the biggest fan of, but like there, there's pieces of the song that I love. You know what I'm saying? And I think they're so like the, and, and I, they want that form though. You know what I'm saying? You can tell they're intentional about, they, they want a form that is not this classic pop form and it's not going to appeal in that classic rock or pop way. But they're still very, very cool. And I like what they've got going on. Elevated Underground's making some noise in the Vegas scene as well. And they're, and rightfully so, because they're dope. Who else am I liking? Th- those are just a few names. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good list. And everyone listening, myself included, have now some homework to go do. So, I mean, while we're on the topic, let's talk about Las Vegas music. Because everyone knows casinos. Everyone knows the Rat Pack, the big band, the residencies. 
Oh, Jan. Jan Jan too. Sorry. That was another person we're working with and she's awesome. They're both awesome. Jan and Jay are like work together. They're great. Sorry. Continue. No, you're good. I was just going to say, let's talk about who were the last big bands to come out of Vegas that weren't Imagine Dragons and the Killers. And what has been happening? Imagine Dragons was the last big band to come out of Vegas. They were the last big ones. It's, it's weird because, and so before them, the one right before them would be probably Escape the Fate. But now they're more Phoenix-based than they are Vegas-based. Ronnie's still technically from Vegas, and so he's with, you know, Falling in Reverse, and that's great. Five Finger Death Punch, also big Vegas band. Panic and, so Killers of Panic, Imagine Dragons, Five Finger Death Punch, Falling in Reverse are your, your five Vegas bands. There was a band that was supposed to be the band that took off next, and they just didn't in that major way. And so I think I like I'm, I'm whatever about it. I I I don't think their stuff was quite catchy enough, and I just I think they were so close to the wave they just didn't quite hit it. And that was Brumby. Brumby, yeah, okay, yeah. Brumby was I remember that Brumby was getting getting some hype. They were they were building in that direction, and then just it wasn't quite it. Yeah, but they're cool guys. Like Oliver is really cool. I'm trying to think of who else that. Yeah, Vegas. Outside of that, hasn't had like something someone take off in a minute. Not to say that the music scene isn't great here. There's a really cool math rock scene that's been developing with bands like Hunter's Briefcase, like Post NC, like Elephant King. I don't know if they're quite math rock, but they're kind of in that vibe. Pure noise, white support. White, pure noise, white support, a little more punk. So there's, there's stuff happening. There's always been a really vibrant hard rock scene here. There's some really cool stuff happening in rap as well, in, in indie folk, singer-songwriter stuff as well. So there's stuff cool going on, just no one's hit yet. And it doesn't mean they won't soon. It's just no one has since Imagine Dragon. Do you think it's been because of like a disinterest or the venues or what do you think is like to blame or contributing to that lack? I think, I think it's partially the alternative rock in general had a lull, you know, I mean, imagine dragons is, was the biggest band of like the last decade, whether people like it or not, that's just the way it is. And their live shows are great. I don't know if you've ever been to one, but they're phenomenal. Oh, dude, I recommend it highly. And their last album was sick. that good. Oh, I liked them. And then I heard Evolve and I wasn't as big a fan of Evolve. And then I went to their live show and I was like, I don't even care. Like, I just love all their music now because it's just they're, they're that good live. I've heard Nickelback is also really, really good live, which is funny because they both get memed on a lot. But they're performers. They, Imagine Dragons is super performance heavy. They go hard. They go hard. Imagine Dragons. Boom. So, yeah, Imagine Dragons is great live. The reason I would say that you're not, you haven't seen a band from Vegas come into that big place is one, the alternative rock scene in general, like the rock scene has been very, just like not as big. You, you haven't seen a lot of bands blow up in a big way in general across the board. You know, like name me a band who's blown up in the past five years. Uh, to your point, I don't think you can. It's like the Billie Eilish, it's the Bad Bunny, it's the, uh, the single folks, right? It, there's rappers who have blown up. You know, like Roddy Rich, Roddy Rich blew up in a huge way. J.I.D. was recently blowing up in a massive way. You've got some Japanese bands that have made some really great name for themselves, like King Yu, for example. So you have, you have people who are making names for themselves in rock in some places. But in general, U.S., Great Britain, you're not getting it. Polyphia has been huge, too. Polyphia, you could say, is like a band who's blown up in a big way in the last five years. Like Echo. Echo, Echo blew up recently, and he's, he's been doing pretty well for himself. He has like a pretty... He, he's probably like the, the post-Imagine Dragons person who blew up would probably be Echo. You know, and he worked with the Churcos. So, I mean, that makes sense. But outside of that, like, yeah, you just haven't had band from here really 
come into their own. Yeah, in general, just there hasn't been a band anywhere that's blown up. Do you feel like the pandemic stunted more of that? Do you feel like TikTok and those things, all the recent last few years changes have have just completely changed the game? Or is it just the natural evolution and people catch on? So I think it's prevented, I mean, the pandemic absolutely prevented live music from popping off. And and it stunted a lot of those more traditional methods of bands becoming big because your your traditional method of a band becoming big, like non-social media is going to music conferences, going to showcases, playing in front of labels, showing your performances, showing what you can do, maybe showing your records as well. And then just building off of that until you have a full thing. Right. So that is like, the traditional way of building a band. And that just didn't happen at all during the pandemic. And so you saw some artists come into their own during the pandemic that were holdouts from before that were already blowing up. So Roddy Rich is a great example of that. Roddy Rich is someone who was making his way through those music conferences, making his way through that scene. And he'd gotten to that exposure point with the box and it became this huge song, right? And that was just like right at the start of the pandemic. But you don't see a lot of new artists in general right now haven't been, like garnered success via TikTok, via bedroom pop, via those methods, because that's all that was available for a second. And the medium is the message. And that's how music works. You know, whatever medium it's coming through, that's the thing you're getting. Do you think it cheapens music at all? Does it change how we consume it at all that... A song gets pushed by TikTok's algorithm, and now you've got uh, 400,000 videos using the same audio. Does it make a big difference? Would you be bothered if that's how you got famous or if that was your splash? I would be the opposite of bothered. I would love it. Dude, I'm at this point where if I can make gross amounts of money doing music, I won't complain how I got there. You know, I think that's silly. I think it's silly to like get into a complaining mode there. You want to blow, like, everyone wants to blow up on social media right now. People do make concerted efforts to try to blow up on social media right now, as they should. Do you think it changes how you look at or write your music, that you're like, this is a catchy hook that could take off on TikTok? Or is that always how music has been? You, you, as an artist, personally, what I prescribe to, and this is not what all musicians prescribe to, and I wouldn't say it's representative of the Vegas market, this opinion, but I always try to write the catchiest thing and the thing that will have a wide appeal and that people will be able to like personally relate to at some level. That is what I try to do. I'm not always the most successful at it because I have other things pulling me, but that is always the goal. I think it makes me consider my marketing, you know? So giving you one example and this is just someone i talked to quite a bit this is there's a guy who was into my music and so we we started like kind of communicating back and forth and his artist name is summer 2000 he does pretty well for himself now gets like a few i think he has like fifty thousand monthly listeners on spotify so he's doing well you know point me twenty thousand thirty thousand something like that some in that range and he does what is called fifth wave emo and his album that really blew up is called John Krasinski and it's this mugshot of John Krasinski that says summer 2000 underneath it and he used that as his album cover okay and it's this very silly thing and then when you open it up the songs are somewhat serious right they're 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 in this fifth wave emo they're emo songs so they're darker tone right and so that marketing approach that like silliness on the surface type of thing is definitely like a TikTokable thing. Like that's a very zoomer thing is to have like something that seems silly that then gets like really dark and intense in like two seconds. You know what I'm saying? And so it fit really well in that way. So then that makes me consider, okay, well how am I marketing things and how are people consuming things and how are people viewing it? And are they willing to consume it based off of the marketing that has been presented for it you know 
Like, how is the pitch going? And how is that pitch creating interest? I mean, I've seen how you're marketing your album covers, how your music has continued to change over the years. Because your first album dropped, was it 2017 or 2018? 2018, I think. 2018, yeah, maybe. 2018, yeah. maybe, yeah. I mean, would you say... Would you say you're marketing your album covers the way you're writing songs has drastically changed album to album and you've done something completely new? Was there like a moment or a shift of like, oh, no, no, I'm doing this instead? Album covers, no. I think now I want like, yeah, no, not album covers. Because maybe was that silhouette thing and I just had like a very specific idea for that. And then the next three albums are literally all just pictures of my face in different contexts. It's actually the same picture of my face used through different filters. <laughs> With a little Photoshop. Yeah, yeah it's, just, okay. it's the same picture of my face Photoshopped in different ways for different album covers. You're right. So Patient was 2020. Yeah, well, technically Patient was 2019. The digital came out in 2020. Digital came out in yeah. 2020. And then okay. Popra was 2021. No, 2020. It was 2020 as well. Popra was 2020. Patient was 2019. 2021 you have giovanni so patient popper and giovanni it's all the same picture of me just just photoshopped in different ways (laughs) fantastic okay 2022 you have bashing my head through a wall which was influenced by kanye because yay had kanye had that donda album cover that was just that all black thing right so and he said the purpose of it is that when you look like everyone's consuming on your, their phones anyway. So when they look at their phone, they'll see a reflection of themselves. That's why he did that. And so I saw that and I was like, well, my album's all about redefining the perception of ourselves. And it, that's part of what the album's about. And so um, that's why I have a black screen with cracks in it. I wonder when I'd seen it, I was like, okay, I saw you post about on social media. I'm like, Interesting, the cracks, almost like spider webs, but now... It was literally cracks in my phone. I took a picture of a phone that broke. And we can all relate. Yep. And so uh, that was the idea of like, hey, let's l- make people look at themselves and see that that's not a true image of themselves. Now, I know we've got an article from you on Inqua about how you write songs, but maybe talk a little bit about... Has it changed at all? Like you just said, you want to write the poppiest thing. How do you feel like you uniquely approach music? I think the thing that I do, I'm, so there's two things I want to say to that. One, I am an addict to form and I'm very into form and to defining the subject matter and to making sure that there's an idea that is concise and conveyed in that way. But people who listen to my music tend to think, tend to get the impression that it is very freeform and that it is a continuous thought process on an idea. And I don't want to tell them they're wrong. So they are right. Leave the facade. Yeah, no, and, and, I'm, and I'm cool with that because if they, if they want to think that it's very freeform and that it feels very emotional, that's how they relate to it. And I want them to continue to have that experience. It, it is super methodical is hyper methodical but it's that I, I think people want to have this image from listening to my music that it is this free form creative spur of the moment thing lyrically and musically and so i want i want that to be an accessible image to them but i would say the thing so people get that perception that it's very free form the other thing i would say is that my music in general, and I just, I can't shake this, is that it takes on, it's very like, I write music album to album very much, you know, for my solo stuff. When I'm working with other artists, it's song to song, right? Except for maybe with Harley, we, we have the concept of Jack-Jack and we follow that as the core concept because that core concept of Jack-Jack is to create music that looks for hope in darkness, right? And so you'll see that theme go throughout all of our music. And so because of that, when I write with her, we were always looking for how can we make this song into a hopeful song? How can we make this encouraging? Like something you might hear from Sia, you know? That uplifting vibe to the music. 
solo wise, I'm very album to album. So, you know, you listen to maybe, and it's just, it's just one big love story, right? You listen to the patient and it's all about suffering and it's about, you know, economic disparities. It's about going through health things. It's, it's a lot about that. And like family members going through health things. And then you listen to Papra and it's this super dramatic operatic thing. You listen to Giovanni and it's a hundred percent a story, you know, that not even pretending to be anything else of like a Faustian bargain, basically. You listen to bashing my head through a wall and it's just like a big old therapy session. And so then the next thing I, I'm kind of deciding between a few different perspective ideas, but they're all like, it's an album worth of things, you know? It's hard for me to break away from that of like always seeing it in terms of the complete album and the complete set of songs. So I think that's probably, I don't think that's as common. I think sometimes I think it's common. I think, oh, that's how all artists write. All artists write in albums, but most artists don't write in albums. They write in songs. Yeah, to your point, unless we're talking about like the Killers and Pressure Machine or otherwise, uh, it's a compilation of things that you've heard from years ago that are thrown on there, and it doesn't sound like a complete story where, like you've done with all your albums, it's a story, each one, of like, this is the theme, this is where my head's at, which I have, have appreciated about your music is, you don't feel like you're on Maybe and you're going to get some random song about, you know, <laughs> me and Julio down the schoolyard. It's all about what the, the theme and the, the story of the mm. album is. Yeah, and I, I just haven't, I mean, it's not always as strict a story, you know? Like, the patient doesn't really have a strict story. Papa doesn't have as much a strict story. Even Bashing My Head is not as strict a story. There's still story to it. It's like a mental health journey more. But yeah, it's, it's a thing I can't shake. You know? It, like, finding a... Con- like, go, going conceptual is too enjoyable for me. Like, that's something that just lights me up about writing music. When I'm writing with someone else, I very much try to understand who they are as an artist, what they're looking for, what their interests are, and how to bring out the image that people want to see in them. You know, I want to create something people can believe in. I like that. And I mean, when you talk about your audience or who you're connecting with, do you like to get or do you get fan mail? Do you, does, does, does someone tell you about what they like about each album? Or how do you kind of know the, what, you're, what you're planning to do is being received in the way you want it to? So I, I, it's hard to ever know if what you're planning to do is going to be received well. You know, And that's kind of the hard thing about being a musician is that you don't know. You can kind of, like, I, I'll play songs at open mics you know, and see how people respond to it. And people will tell me which songs were like catchiest to them and which songs they liked the most. But it's hard to like show them a new song. And one week you might get a lot of applause and one week you might get very little. And that might have less to do with the quality of the song and more to do with how you performed it that night, you know? And so it's hard to say like, oh, this one's good while this one's bad. I have noticed a trend that people like my songs that have imagery that is a little more whimsical in nature, you know? So like I've got a lot of positive response about strawberries in July. And I think that's partially because just the chorus is very much just strawberries and makes you think of strawberries and it's easy to remember. And then you remember when strawberries are actually in season because everyone's like strawberries aren't in season in July. And I'm like, yeah, they are. That's when they're in season. Grow up. That's why I call it this song. This the song that name. And then I've no and then like hoodie song is a song that people still will talk to me occasionally about. And that's a very whimsical song with like heavy imagery. And so I try I, th- that's what I'm trying to focus on for this next project because I'm kind of getting that feedback. But you know, it's, it's hard to say exactly what to do. And it's hard to, it's hard to say like uh, an audience audience, because I'm at a point right now where that audience isn't massive. You know, I mean, Giovanni has quite a few views on YouTube. It has like a couple thousand, but that's more because I promoted it in a video that got 300,000 views, you know? So I, And I I don't know that there's like a audience that's on pins and needles waiting for 
more Giovanni type content. You know what I'm saying? Just waiting for the next thing from me. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a place where I can still create that new audience and decide what that new audience is going to be. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know if that was really rambly. No, I mean, I think it makes sense. And to your point, you're not exactly sending out a survey every single time an album comes out where you can just get back like, Oh, everyone liked X, Y, Z. And you don't have 2 million streams on one song to know what hit it's to your point. You're in that earlier stage of kind of figuring it out. And, people discovering and finding that music. Yeah. One thing that did happen with bashing my head through a wall that I realized is that most people expected the album to be a lot darker and heavier than it was because of the name of the album and the imagery of the album. And so there was hesitation and I consistently got the response of people who said, I, I, when I listened to it, I realized I should have listened to this earlier. It was so good. And they're like, it's probably like a lot of people were like, oh, this is like my favorite thing you've done, but they were hesitant to even touch it because of the name because of the, name, the, uh, the, the album, album art. art, which is fascinating to me. I hear that and I'm like, oh, shoot, like I need to, I need to, to do things that people are willing to touch, you know, and that they're willing just to be extra intentional about, yeah, even the title of an album. Cause right. So like work working title for the next album is narwhals in space right because you can tell anyone about that and they're going to be like interesting i want to see what's going on there you know it's not like oh i'm hesitant to touch that because i don't want to be made sad you know so i don't know it, yeah i mean where in a songwriting journey where do you start are you more like a music first a lyrics first does it come with every song is there any kind of method to it as far as what happens every time or in general? So it depends on who I'm working with and how I'm working with them, right? So, like, if I'm working with Harley, it's generally music first, and it's, like, the surrounding aspects of the music first. It's not as melody-centric off the bat. It's normally more harmonic centric so it's like we have a chord progression and then we go from there or we have a chord progression and a a portion of a melody but we have no concept of what the lyrics are going to be about as we start that and sometimes we'll make like a whole track and then we'll be like okay what what is what's the song about that's actually often what we do we'll have the whole track done and then we'll say okay what's what's the name of the song like what what are we doing here what's the idea that we're going to pursue here when i write music for myself It's typically lyric, melody, combination first. It's concept focused a little more. So like giving an example of, say, gray blue eyes, you know, I start out with that. I don't trust those gray blue eyes that are staring back at me. And I'm playing that in D flat Dorian, right? So I knew, okay, I want to write a song in D flat Dorian. And I'm going to, I want, I want to write a song. Yeah, I want to write a song in Defect Thorin. Exactly that. And so then I grabbed my guitar, played that first, you know, D minor chord. And then just like, and knew that I wanted to have something with this idea of like, not trusting the man I see in the mirror type of thing, you know, kind of that Michael Jackson-esque vibe of like, I'm, I'm starting with the man in the mirror, but like, what if I don't even like the man in the mirror type of thing and like taking that too far almost, you know, to like a self-loathing type place. So I had that concept in mind and I knew that that was kind of the direction the album was going already. So I sat down with that concept and said like, okay, don't trust those gray blue eyes and started working out the song from there, you know, and then the chorus used to be completely different. And then, uh, you know, it revisions, revisions, revisions until you get what you're looking for. And as I'm writing songs now, it's very much like, okay, I know I want to be whimsical on this album, you know, this Narwhals in Space project. And so it's like, okay, what's like a weird whimsical image to start with? And then I go from there and I draw back into, like I use that concept to start flowing things out. And I'm trying to be a little more freeform because that's what people think I am anyway with the content. And so it's kind of going in these ridiculous directions, you know? So. I don't know. 
with as often as you're playing music, do you feel like you're trying more out for the new album right now? Do you want to kind of have a better idea and have the album fleshed out before you start playing things live? What's that process? So I'm wanting with this one, I am wanting to show the songs to people more. That's kind of how I came to this concept. Cause I had like four or five different concepts for albums that I was working on. One that actually has like the most songs written for it. I don't think I'm going to do for a while. Um, and so like I, I wrote a bunch of different stuff and I've shown people different stuff. And the one that I, that I feel the best about in that live setting is kind of the direction I was like, okay, I want to go that direction, but it's, and I do want to like introduce the songs to people in a live setting to kind of like work through it. Uh, like the steroid song that I'm writing, cause I'm writing a song about steroids and male body image, right? Cause it, it's something that you don't hear enough about in songs. You hear about it in f- female. That's like a really popular femme empowerment thing is redefining female body image. But there's a lot of body dysmorphia among men that isn't as talked about. And there's a lot of steroid abuse that goes on. It's something that you like, I've seen commercials for peptides or what it's called peptides. Yeah. They're called peptides, right? The stuff that like artificially in, in like tells your body to produce more testosterone. Like I've seen straight up commercials on like TV for those. That's like, I don't know if we want to live in that world where that's going down. You know what I'm saying? We might be going too far. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. What, what do you think about that? I'm kind of curious. Oh, I mean, there's a great book about it. I think it was a few years ago, the Adonis complex. And I heard a few podcasts discussing the same thing of like, it's less talked about and it definitely happens to a less extent because I think males make up a smaller economic market but it's definitely growing of like get jacked everyone needs to be on testosterone everyone needs to be bulking up on protein all these different things to look like the guys on love island or or the superheroes the bachelor or the superheroes yeah i mean the days of like the fluffy comedian are gone i mean kumal Nanjani looks ripped chris pratt everyone's favorite dad bod ripped so i definitely felt the pressure again not to the level of women and not even going to go there but to your point it's under talked about and you see people just kind of buying into dangerous things that they should not be taking. right yeah it, it, i was kind of inspired toward it we were someone was talking about the victoria's secret song i don't know if you've heard of it and i just thought it was a weird song because it, 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 the basic premise of the song is like, it's a body image song and it's like, Oh, Victoria's secret was like making me think I had to be this like skinny little girl, which is weird. Cause now Victoria's secrets, like not really part of that anymore. They're very much on the other side of things. I would say not, not hundred percent on the other side, but you know, they're, they're definitely toward that other side. They want a wide market. Wrong <laughs> choice of words. <laughs> okay. They want to capture more market. Right. And so, so, we were talking about that and, and in the song she says like, oh, I figured out Victoria was actually an, some old guy in Ohio, but that old guy in Ohio started Victoria's Secret and then quickly sold it after like two or three years owning it. Like not, not that long after, like Victoria's Secret has not been owned by some random dude in Ohio for a very long time. And it doesn't resemble, like none of the stuff that she's talking about happened while he was in any way in charge. So the song is, the premise is inherently false and Victoria's Secret as a company got mad at it. And I heard about it while hanging out with some friends and family. And I was like, that's so stupid because one, the premise was wrong. And two, like we've heard that before, you know, scars to your beautiful already did it. Sit still look pretty already did it. You know, like we've heard the female body image Lizzo's first album that blew up. Did it, you know? Yeah. All about that base. Yeah. All about that base. You've heard it a lot but you don't hear it from the, the guy perspective as much. So I decided to write a song called steroids. And I'm still working on it, but I tested it out in front of people. And I realized while testing, I was like, okay, these lyrics don't work. These lyrics do work. Like just feeling it in that moment kind of altered my thought process toward it. Yeah. Yeah. And then I've also like shopped it to people who, who I trust, you know, in the songwriting vibe and said like, what do you think about this? And Harley actually helped me with it. Cause at first it was a little more satirical and she's like, it sounds more like a musical satirical thing. You need to be more empathetic toward the people taking steroids. It needs to be a song that people taking steroids 
can listen to and be like, yes, you know, a little more authentic, a little more genuine, a little more empathetic than it is satirical. Okay. The course became this, like I could inject myself with steroids, take lots of supplements, become a different person just to build some confidence. And like, that's, that sounds like, that doesn't sound like I'm making fun of someone taking steroids. It sounds like I'm someone caught up in steroid use, you know? I like that. You talked about cross promoting your music or, you know, the, the way you're getting out there, Giovanni, through your YouTube channel. Talk a little bit about what you're doing with the YouTube channel and what those videos are like. So, yeah. So, the YouTube channel started out as me realizing I wanted to promote my music more. And I tried it on a diff- bunch of different platforms and i just realized that youtube was the one i liked the most that's how it started so i was like i like youtube i like long form media i i want i don't if i had a choice between watching a tiktok and watching a youtube video like a 10 second tiktok and like but then sitting for 10 minutes watching tiktoks and watching just one 10 minute video essay i take the video essay any day you know and so i said to myself self why are, why are you spending so much time on social media that you don't even like? And so then I started making YouTube videos. It started out with silly things. And then I actually, because of Inqua, I thought, what if I started making music review videos? And I made a couple of music review videos and people said, hey, the thing to do on YouTube is not review, but react. And I was like, okay, let me try it. So I started doing that and it started getting really good views. And then it became more and more of a thing of like, okay, what's the niche here? And at first I would like review it at the end. And then I realized, you know, I don't actually care to review music. Like that's like, first and foremost, I don't care about that. I care about increasing people's enjoyment to the music they already like. And so I stopped, I tried to give less of a qualitative read on the music and more of a, this is what's going on. This is what's cool that they're doing here. And this is the cultural impact this could have. And this is, these are the, this is the way you can read that from a cultural standpoint. And this is how the music is conveying these thoughts that the artist wants to convey. And so, and then at the end of my videos, I now always say like, I hope that this video helped you to further enjoy the music that you already like. I like that. And the idea that instead of critiquing or coming down on or finding fault with music, the people who are watching your videos, like you said, already like it. It's pointing out things for those who love it to, to love more. Yeah. So that's what I kind of changed into. And yeah, it, I've had some videos that have just done really, really well. And then recently I started up the Spanish one because I thought, you know what? I speak Spanish. Why not start a Spanish one? And I've only made two videos on that channel, but both of them have over 40,000 views which is wild. That's like inappropriate. And that one's already like into like the thousands of subscribers, you know, which it's crazy. It's just so crazy. And the reason I got into YouTube in general, like the reason I'm doing anything there is because I thought, you know, I want to, I could pay someone to have a YouTube channel and talk about my music or I could talk about my music on my YouTube channel. And one of those is just more interesting. Like one, one's just easier for me. Like, why pay someone when I can make my own YouTube video? Like, one's more fun. It's and you're good at it. And if you like it, I guess I'm good at it. I honestly sometimes make a video and I'm like, I wonder if anyone like will give two dumps about what I have to say, and then I'll put it out into ether, and then you know, forty thousand views later, I'm like, why do they care (laughs) about what I'm saying? (laughs) I don't get it. I mean, I do, I do produce music and I do write music. Like that is a serious thing that I do. It's not like a joke, but like, you know, I'm not like, I'm not this, I'm not like, you know, Dan Reynolds. I'm not Rick Rubin. I'm not John Bellion. You know, I'm not like this huge name. I'm just a guy who's doing it. I know what I'm doing, but I'm not a well-known name in it. So it's just funny that people like listening to my thoughts on it. Even more so in Spanish, apparently. Even and more I'm not so that great Spanish. at Spanish, so it's really funny to me. Fantastic. <laughs> well, I'm going to let you go. Have a good rest of your night, and we'll catch up soon. And thanks again for coming on today, Kevin.